All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I, I realize that we've talked a lot about quenching and, um, hold on, let me move this down a wee bit. Um, we've talked a lot about quenching and what leads to the growth of um, early type galaxies. I thought, hey, I'm going to talk about something different. So this is a project that I'm doing with the candles data set. And I'm trying to understand how the Milky Way and its peers might grow in a cosmological context. Um, and if I have enough time at the end, I might talk a little bit about uh, some very nearby galaxies and what we can learn from those. But I'll, I'll focus on this right now. Uh, this is work that's being done with the candles and 3D HST data set with Casey Papovich, uh, Karen Sharon, and Brian Terrazas at the University of Michigan, and then Arjen Vandervel and Peter Beruzzi, uh, and then the whole candles team. So I, I wanted to start by um, attempting to motivate why one, you know, what are Milky Way mass galaxies and then why do I care? Um, this is a, a picture from Sloan, a set of postage stamps uh, from Casey Papovich's paper that he just submitted of galaxies at the Milky Way mass scale. So uh, around five, six times 10 to the 10 solar masses uh, in the local universe. And one can see there's a great diversity. So there's one thing that's obvious uh, and has been talked about a lot is that at this mass, it's really a peak conversion efficiency from uh, gas into stars. And so these are the most, uh, where the kind of average stars, if you like, or the median stars in the universe live. Um, then one can see here, it's really the maximally diverse population. It's really where about half of the population is quiescent and no longer forming stars at a significant rate, and the other half are forming stars happily. And uh, it has, and, and correlated with that, is the full range of disk to spheroid ratios where you have things that uh, look like ellipticals. We know they're rotating, but they, they look like ellip ellipticals, uh, all the way through to uh, essentially bulgeless spirals. And then finally, we live in one, which is always a good reason to think about it. Uh, and we're close to a number of other ones, right? So we're coming up to this age where we're understanding, uh, or we're about to understand much more about the star formation history and kinematics of all the stars, essentially all the stars in the Milky Way, and many, many stars in M31. M31 is already resolved into 100 million stars with fat. And uh, this will happen more and more with more and more distant galaxies. Uh, these are some of our you know, about three and a half par uh, megaparsec away star uh, galaxies that are nearby. And this is a real chance for us to build some intuition about how these guys grow and then how the, um, the local versions of this, whether we can actually connect those sets of intuitions together. And so in, in the long term, I think this is a very valuable thing to think about. Um, this is a picture we all know and love. This is uh, part of the UDF. It's not, not a lot of the UDF. And uh, you know, the problem that one faces while looking at this is that one has no idea what these galaxies turn into. So you find out, you know what their properties are at that given redshift, but you do not know what their fates are. Um, and in order to do that, you have to not only understand what the properties of galaxies are at given cosmic times, so you have to do this, the hard work of getting the census right, but then one needs to put that together with uh, cosmological interpretations or models or simulations to attempt to develop the intuition for being able to connect these little blobs that you see at different redshifts at different cosmic times into plausible life stories of how something like our galaxy may have formed. So this has been done in a couple different ways uh, in the past. And so nor normally we took the, you know, back in the olden days, uh, we thought this was impossibly hard, and so we thought, okay, we just have to use these to get these right, and then we'll believe the stories that they tell us. Um, and more recently, uh, it's been hoped that one can observationally try and circumvent some of that by uh, trying to understand the evolution of the, the population in a more observationally motivated fashion. The kind of most intuitive method of doing this is to take uh, the, the stellar mass function of galaxies, the cumulative stellar mass function of galaxies. And so if you take this at uh, two redshifts, for example, so this is the stellar mass function at redshift zero, and then the pink uh, is the redshift one version for the sake of argument. And so the idea is that um, one can link at constant co-moving uh, number density, galaxies here and galaxies here, they have the same density per co-moving cubic furlong, and therefore uh, 
one can say, okay, these guys, which have this number density, should turn into those guys. So you essentially uh, decide that the rank order of galaxies should stay the same as a function of time. So if I'm little, I'm always going to be little. And I'm always going to be littler than the 26 other guys in my box. Um, and this has uh, been done for most of the analyses up to date. Uh, Casey Papovich and Peter van Dockham have really pushed this method uh, the furthest. And they've done some reasonable tests of this using uh, dark matter only merger trees to argue that this should not go horribly wrong. Um, so let me show you an example of one of these analyses. This is from uh, Peter van Dockham's uh, and the 3DHST team's paper last year. So this is the, uh, they, they took this method of matching a co constant co-moving cumulative number density, um, which is a mouthful, sorry, and uh, then selected galaxies from redshift two and a half down to redshift zero. And then this is the montage of postage stamps that they, uh, that they have. And then they tracked both the, uh, the structures of the galaxies, finding that one goes from um, more or less a factor of two growth in size uh, for this ensemble of galaxies and going from essentially pure exponential disk through to a, a very large bulge, a significant bulge by the present day for Milky Way mass galaxies. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is a completely reasonable thing to do. I, I thought, I, I've always felt a wee bit anxious about this though, because at least back in the olden days, uh, we became quite concerned that galaxies have a lot of scatter in their formation histories. And simulations um, seem, to, um, seem to kind of agree with that overall picture. So I wanted to take it just one step further, but it's really just a baby step. And so what I want to emphasize here is that we've made, uh, is that, you know, we're making, we're, we're at the very beginning of this journey. We're very slowly moving forwards. And so this is a tiny step in the right direction, but I don't think this is the right answer, uh, nor should you. Um, so the second, the, the, the thing that we've done is to take um, this halo occupation framework that, that now is reasonably well established. And we say, okay, instead of, uh, instead of just directly correcting, connecting galaxies by their number density, we'll do a slightly more sophisticated thing. And we'll connect galaxies to halos at given time, accounting for the amount of scatter that's required, uh, that's required to match stellar mass functions. And then we'll use uh, those fits for the amount of scatter that you have and the halo merger trees to then have a slightly more cosmologically motivated way of the galaxy population building up. And so this has uh, been done to great effect by Peter Beruzzi and Ben Moster. And the, the really decisive advantage of this for the purposes of this kind of exercise is that they get the evolution of the stellar mass function right by design. And so you start out with basically being guaranteed to have the growth history of galaxies at a given, uh, given co-moving number density essentially correct. So this have to agree by design, which is a, a really, nice, um, a really nice advantage. And, uh, there, there are other ways to do this. You can use a semiolytic model. Uh, Joel Leja uh, did a group uh, or did a version of this with a Guoadal semiolytic models uh, again last year uh, to try and understand this issue more. And so this is really trying to build on that with something that matches the stellar mass function better. So what does this framework tell us about how uh, Milky Way mass galaxies might grow? All right. So this is a plot from Peter Beruzzi's paper um, from last year, and this shows the essentially the, the, the growth rate through, uh, through, through in situ star formation. And so all this area is, uh, is the fraction of, of mass that's growing from star formation in that halo at the present day. Um, and so this is present day mass of 10 to 12 to a couple times 10 to 12. This is around where we think Milky Way and its friends live. And uh, this is about the point where about half the mass growth is from star formation. About half the mass growth is, through, is, is being dragged in from elsewhere. And that's at the present day. At earlier times, it was more uh, from star formation. And so uh, only a relatively small fraction of Milky Way -like mass galaxies of, of major merge. This is what one sees from the, uh, from the tracks. But minor mergers and accretions are much more frequent in this, um, in, in this framework. And something I really want to focus on is that the scatter in these growth, uh, growth histories is quite significant. And that's why I made it yellow. All right. So let me show you um, one way of visualizing this. And you know, this, is, this is work in progress. Uh, and so if, 
Uh, I'm, I'm still not quite sure that this is the right way to show it, but um, let's try and see what happens. All right, so you have a plot of the stellar mass of galaxies uh, as a function of redshift 0 to 2, and this is a, a ridiculous range in stellar mass. That's four orders of magnitude in stellar mass. These little green guys up here are uh, present-day Milky Way peers. Right, so we've defined it as between 10 to 10 point, uh, 10.65 to 10.8 in this particular uh, in this particular track. So then, from Peter Peruzzi's tracks, you go back, which incorporate both astrophysical scatter and some estimate of observational scatter, which is actually kind of important because observational scatter can say can can make something that should be Milky Way mass actually look more massive than it. Um, and so we, we go back and we say, OK, these guys here, what masses would, did they have at various redshifts? And this green uh, area is the 90 percentile um, range of where things that are here today ended up at redshift 1 and at redshift 2. And then the blue is uh, things that have lower present day mass. The red is, um, is higher present day mass. The quantitative version of this, because we're all uh, into numbers, is, is in this plot. This is the, the histograms of, the, um, of the, the, the mass distribution. These green guys are the ones we're interested in, and they spread out over a big range of mass a reg, by redshift 1 and redshift 2. And you can see that those distributions overlap a lot. And this is really the fundamental message. Uh, if, if you take away one message from this talk, take away the message that uh, the growth history of halos is stochastic, well, the growth history of halos and the galaxies within them is stochastic enough such that uh, the, you, you really can't isolate cleanly a sample of things that are going to be Milky Way mass by the present day. There's a lot of contamination when one does that kind of exercise. Well, Correct, correct, because, uh, because I, can, I can have something that's this mass, this is this there, but I make a mistake on the stellar mass estimate, and so it ends up being higher mass. And so these tracks are trying to account for that by saying, you know what, sometimes you guys are going to overestimate the mass, and this happens about that often. It's pretty sobering. It's actually kind of disappointing. Anyway, let's do this exercise forwards. Um, so from the purposes of trying to understand how the... Um, how to interpret the, the growth or, or how to do the progenitor exercise, one can say, I'm going to go to the 68 percentile range at, say, redshift 2, and I'm going to follow the full range. This blue uh, is the full range of, of these things that were selected to have this mass range at redshift 2, which is the 68 percentile range. You look here, and, you, say, and you, you project them through to the present day, and then this is the final range that you end up selecting. And so what you realize is that, hey, I've done a lot of good. I've selected many of the things that end up being Milky Ways. Awesome. I've also liked selected a bunch of crap I'm not interested in. Poop, right? That's, that's no fun. What do I do with that? Um, and and this, is, this is a generic problem. So we've uh, started working on this with the Guo et al. and Enrique et al. semi-analytic models, which both have different mass function evolutions. And the, this problem, to a greater or lesser extent, applies for all of them. So that qualitatively, this is happening for everybody. Quantitatively, we may not have the degree of this right, and I'm the first person to admit that, but I'm simply telling you guys, this qualitatively happens, and it's happening to all of these analyses. And we do have to think about what, what the analyses mean. Um, and so I, and nobody says yikes anymore. So I figured I'd put it on a slide. Yikes, right? This is not good. Uh, you know, I've, I don't get all the present day Milky Way mass galaxies in the sample. And most of my sample ends up being something else uh, by the present day. But generally lower mass. And that makes, thank you, that makes a lot of sense because the, mass, the halo mass function is quite steep. OK. And so this summarizes that this scatter in growth histories um, that one infers from the, the models is, is really quite significant. And so any progenitor selection uh, is incom incomplete and very contaminated. And the degree of contamination will depend on the scatter. I don't, we've tried, I mean, you know, the, the models do as well as they can in attempting to motivate that scatter. So it's the best scatter that anyone has, but it's still, um, uh, 
exactly the extent of the contamination does degree on that. And it's mostly with low mass galaxies, which I think is obvious. It's a tan of Malmquist bias. OK. So in order to proceed, uh, one needs to uh, make an assumption. One needs to assume, and this is what everyone does, by the way, in the progenitor business. Right? Is, is, this is happening to everybody. And so one simply needs to assume that the galaxies that are in a given mass range at redshift 2, for example, that they don't know what they're going to become. Right? So that there's no, you essentially assume that there's no hidden parameters that aren't stellar mass that determine what the galaxy is going to turn into. In practice, I think that's probably a terrible assumption. Or at least galaxy formation models would like to believe that's a terrible assumption. But we don't know uh, how to do any better. It would be nice to have more observational measures that one could apply to this. But um, the number of, of reliable observational measures that one can use that are monotonic is, I guess, uh, central density and stellar mass. And that's it. And we haven't done the, stellar, uh, the central density yet. But I think it's worth thinking about in the future. So for now, um, what I wanted to do was to uh, apply this to the candles data set, understand the extent to which we can uh, reproduce the 3D HST measurements from a subset of the data uh, that was done before, um, and see if we can understand something about, the, um, about this kind of growth towards very prominent bulges that they saw in Milky Way mass galaxies. So this is the data set. And um, uh, now, in some sense, candles and 3D HST, from a practical point of view, are basically married. Um, it may be an uneasy marriage, but it's <laughs> essentially uh, complete. And so um, the, I'm using here the five field uh, candles uh, and 3D HST data set that Roz Skelton uh, and the 3D HST team released. Uh, it has um, reasonably standard photo re photometric redshifts, rest frame colors, and stellar mass estimates. It's uh, welded together with uh, Ariane van der Velde's uh, Sursich fits and uh, has been corrected to rest frame G-band sizes following uh, Ariane's uh, 2014 analysis, where he looked at color gradients uh, quite carefully. Uh, at low redshift, uh, I'm using the uh, MPHHU uh, catalog. I've got a, a relatively uh, low redshift galaxies to make them nice and big in the sky, and then I'm welding that together with Samard's G-band Sursich fits. Um, and so it's, it's, it's actually reasonably comparable um, from redshift to redshift, which is, is quite pleasant. One thing that is worth noting is that um, I guess, I don't know the extent to which this is publicly available, and Joel, you might know this better, but uh, Ariane has done a hell of a job in actually going through and checking about the 6,000 edge cases where they might have weird redshifts or funny sizes or whatever, and has thrown things out and kept things uh, depending on whether they look good or not. And so I don't know if, is that publicly released? I don't think it is. So I think you have to talk to Arian nicely if you want it, but he's done a hell of a lot of value-added hard work. And this is one of the main motivations for using this uh, particular catalog. So this is then the demographics of the population. Uh, and you can tell it's kind of preliminary because uh, these red guys aren't coming out, sorry. Um, this is uh, from this merged data set from redshift 2.5 down to redshift 0, essentially an optical color against stellar mass along the bottom. Uh, the, the log mass is from 9 to 12. So this is uh, color mass, size, half G-band half-light radius mass as a function of redshift. And then this is the um, either UVJ or URZ um, diagram for attempting to differentiate between quiescent and um, star-forming galaxies. And then on this plot, I show the histogram of the, the, the descendants of things that end up here uh, from Peter Beruzzi's tracks. And, uh, and then one selects a range of those, which I've shown in, in green for the ones that we selected for the next exercise. Whether those selections are quite right is TBD. Uh, and the, this histogram may change a wee bit as we change some of the details. But this is approximately what we're doing. What are the white curves again? These guys? So this is, uh, if you take these galaxies in Peter Beruzzi's uh, tracks, and you evolve them backwards, that white histogram is what turns into those at the present day. And what are the green ones? Those are the things I take. And then there's going to be a bunch of other junk in there, too, that ends up being something lower mass at the present day that I also select. But this is showing you I'm getting the core of the distribution. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let me show you the results. 
Um, this is, um, uh, it's, it's reasonably similar to the, the plots that, uh, that I was showing you from, from Peter's work. This is Sersage index against redshift, so from redshift three to zero, uh, Sersage index from zero to eight, half-light radius from zero to eight, um, eight kiloparsecs. This is G-band half-light radius, so it's rest frame G-band, not, not observe frame G, but rest frame G, all the way from redshift two and a half to the present day. Then the average axis ratio, uh, and then this is the, the, the range in masses used. Um, and so what I want you to uh, focus on is first the white lines, and so uh, one sees that we more or less reproduce the previous results uh, from, from Van Dockum and collaborators. Um, the Sersage indices go from about one and a half to three and a half, which is about what they had. The half-light radii, uh, a little bit more than double. We have slightly bigger half-light radii for some reason, which I haven't quite figured out yet. Uh, but they're, they're scaled up all redshifts, so I, it may be, a, I actually don't know what it is. Um, could be something goofy like H naught, H inverse megaparsecs or whatever. Um, then there's axis ratio uh, going for a uh, bunch of randomly inclined uh, thin disks uh, would have an average value of a half and then a bunch of spheroids end up being something like 0.7 is the axis ratio. And so then you see the axis ratio of the population going from looking like a bunch of disks uh, to looking like uh, more or less a bunch of spheroids uh, at the present day. Now, um, and so this, this was used to say, well, the size grows a bit, but the bulge is growing like crazy. And uh, I wanted to split that into um, the star forming and the quiescent part of the population in order to try and understand. So the, the, the star forming ones stay in the sample, right? So if I'm star so forming, uh, the sense of quench, the quench population building up to the present day is that things mostly turn off and don't often turn back on. And so we're going to assume that they only turn off, uh, just for the, the current argument. And so then the star forming ones, they're always, you know, if the star forming ones today were always star forming, so we're in the sample, but then some of them wander off into the quiescent population and stay there as a kind of sink term. If one looks at just the star formers, then one sees that the, uh, the Sersage index does change, but it's nowhere near as big an effect. And so uh, one, um, the, the surface brightness profile is going from exponential to uh, having a bit of a bulge, but uh, it's nowhere near as significant as for the whole sample. And then one sees that the evolution of the half-light radius is much more pronounced. Right? So this fits with the idea of, of the disks more or less growing in an inside-out way, keeping more or less an exponential profile. And so you have some growth in the middle. I mean, that's unavoidable. You do have growth in the middle of the galaxy, but you have a lot of growth in the outer part. So it's something like this, right, rather than uh, rather than something that's like this, right, going up in the middle. Um, in contrast, the quiescent guys, uh, as the quiescent population's emerging, it comes out already having Sersage index of four, uh, already having um, spheroid looking axis ratios, um, and, uh, and then having uh, a size that, that actually increases quite dramatically towards the present day. But again, most of these, this is a population that's growing, um, and, and many of these things were star formers at an earlier time. And so we, and we had discussion of how quenching mechanisms might change size, et cetera. And these are rest frame G, so I'm, uh, you know, one needs to redo this with stellar masses. That's the next step. That's an improvement in the future, but that's it. All right. Um, Sandy, do you want me to show my last slide, or do you want to ask the question now? You, you answered it. Oh, I did? Yeah. Holy cow. What a happy accident. All right. Um, so uh, this is my summary. Um, so how do Milky Way mass galaxies grow? Um, and the answer is, is that I'm really not as sure as I wish I was, right? And part of that is because uh, the, the models with, with you know, physically motivated scatter, right? Peter needed to, no, it, in fact, all halo occupation needs to put in scatter between halo mass and stellar mass in order to get the mass functions right and the correlation functions, et cetera. If you have that scatter, um, that really affects this exercise and it implies that many of the progenitor samples are both incomplete, probably to a lesser extent, but very contaminated. And, uh, and I view that to be a potentially big problem. Uh, if one goes ahead and does this in a spirit of hopefulness, which, which many of us are wont to do, uh, 
Then one sees that the star forming progenitors appear to grow mostly inside out with an approximately exponential profile, developing a bit of a bulge towards the present day. Um, and that much of the bulge growth that was seen, for example, by uh, Van Dockum et al, is really because of the emergence of a, uh, I'm not going to say a separate population, but a separate population of, uh, of spheroid dominated galaxies that, that just become increasingly prominent towards the present day. Thank you very much. I think it would, I think it would help. Um, it would help a bit, um, and so one of the reasons is, is that it would get rid of. So if you had, well, it, you'd have to have a lot of magic. You'd have to have uh, halo mass, and then you'd have to have a way of getting halo mass with no scatter. I think those things would help a lot, actually. That'd be really cool um, because it's really kind of. So there is diversity then in the halo growth tracks, but that diversity is already included in this is it screws us up a little bit, but doesn't screw us up as much as the, I mean, it's, it's part of screwing it up, but it isn't most of screwing it up. So I'd actually think that would be potentially quite nice. Unfortunately, we don't have that. So you, you showed us these nice- Do you want to unplug? Yes. at the beginning in which, okay, if the Milky Way has a halo mass today- Do you need this? Then here's the distribution of halo masses that it might've had in the past. Yes. That those distributions were very wide. Yes. Did you show us plots of the same thing, but now assuming that once quenched, always quenched, Milky Way not quenched? So no. let's, let's impose that restriction, and then what do they look like? I, I, would, I would love to do that. The Beruzi et al. tracks are not in a position to do that because they do not address which ones are quenched and which ones ain't. You the way to do that is semiotic models I'm or hydro models. Yeah, so this, these are not SAM tracks. Um, we're doing the analysis right now with the SAM tracks. So Joel did the analysis with the Guo et al. simulic models and addressed the issue of uh, red versus blue, found that mass growth was similar. My concern is, is that the uh, amount of mass growth in the star forming group was, uh, was I think, way too little. Uh, because the, the stellar mass function, I mean, basically stellar mass function is from Guo et al. is wrong. That's why we're doing it with Enrique's right. um, also. This is a really, it's going to be a pretty hard process, but I, want, I very much want to understand whether one can think about quenched and uh, star forming versions uh, properly. This is not proper. This is just a kind of first attempt. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. Well, environment's not monotonic. So, so you need something that's monotonic from redshift to redshift. And so the only one I can think of right now, maybe I'm being unimaginative, is the density within some metric radius, say a kiloparsec. No, not environment. Environment, I think, is, uh, well, so in, environmental measures are usually pretty gross from, uh, from surveys. There are often, there's a lot of scatter in density estimates, and then halo masses can carry considerable error. Um, and so one could, Attempt that, and that might help. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think so. I think adding parameters might help, but you have to be very careful about which ones to add. And uh, I do want to think about using. Uh, I think one needs to to use the models to kind of help generate intuition as to which ones are more or less reasonable to use as one goes on. But using more parameters is clearly the right thing to do. Looking forward, I just don't know. But I think this kind of analysis needs to be done in order to figure out if that's reasonable. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. It goes, it goes in the middle of the 90% of the green. Random selection of objects, which I think is what you're doing. 
Right. He's going to at least be misleading, and you're going to get a lot of Mark Chris type buyers. I know. I know. I actually, yeah. I, I agree entirely. I wouldn't phrase that assumption in quite the same way as you, but I think that's one way of phrasing it. Um, okay, yeah. Yes, thank you.